All right, Brian Sutton, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are you doing? Good, thanks, buddy. Long time no see. Yeah, it has been a while, you know. But um, So listen, most people uh, who watch my show, you know, a lot of Americans um, know me for being coached by David Marsh, but most don't know that you were my first coach and you're also the coach that got me on the Olympic team in 2000 and, and multiple teams after that, world championship teams and, and – you know, for four years, you got me on the Australian team. So, you know, you were the first guy to have a major influence on me. And then, then you took me to the Olympics. So um, nobody's had a bigger impact on my, my life and career than you have. So I certainly wanted to get you on the podcast to, to talk about those things and then also talk about yourself and your own philosophies and beliefs. So first of all, thank you for everything you've done for me. Not a problem, mate. Yeah, I'm glad to be here with you and see you so well. Yeah, I appreciate it. So, listen, for the people that don't know you, give us a little bit about, about your background, how, how you grew up, where you grew up, you know, who influenced you, um, and then how you got into coaching and, and uh, go from there. Um, yeah, well, I grew up in Newcastle, uh, which is about uh, 200 k's uh, north of Sydney, and um, I swam there and uh, eventually left home at 15 to go to uh, Sydney and, and swim at Maroubra where you were mm -hmm. and um, you know I was there uh, for oh, a few years and then I uh, got a scholarship overseas to the University of Hawaii and um, but my parents my father was a coach and a uh, pretty hard coach yeah. <laughs> and yeah. uh, to say the least and my brother ended up coaching and my sister was very involved in the learn to swim movement um, so I suppose we were pretty much destined for it. And, uh, but when I went overseas, I was very, very lucky. I had a, um, I had a great coach in uh, Jan Prins, uh, who, um, uh, he was the head coach at the time and had a sports science department at the University of End Up Coaching. Uh, he was, I was fortunate enough, he, he sort of guided me into a lot of uh, exercise physiology courses and, um, and things of that nature. It gave me a really good grounding for coming back to Australia, which at the time uh, was pretty much um, do as much as you can sort of thing and rest up and hope for the best. So um, he introduced me uh, to a uh, another side of it, which was your testing and your, your science side of it, and uh, having a background himself with uh, Doc Councilman mm -hmm. um, for about eight years, I think he worked as Doc Councilman's assistant, mm -hmm. which um, in itself shows you where, where they were coming from, because he was yeah. basically the, the grandfather of sports science, and um, sort of come back from the, from the swimming career after a, a serious injury, and um, just to get into the coaching and uh, sort of you know, put something back into the sport as well as sort of take it uh, to a different level in this country. Yeah. Mate, you had a major influence on swimming in Australia and we can get into that um, for sure. I mean, you said a while back, a second ago, that your, your father was pretty hard on you as a coach. Like, what were some of the things that he would he would get you to do I, I remember you telling me a story once where he would he tied a rope to your your back and and uh you're out in the ocean i believe and in and he had a brick uh, tied to the other the other end of the, the rope and so you guys had to swim the length of the the beach um dragging these yeah. bricks along the bottom of the the, the ocean is that right yeah well that, that was very innovative if uh, for want of a better term but uh, yeah, we he did sort of start with a, a, a very um, a barbaric form of uh, resistance training, <laughs> and um, uh, there were some other other things we, we used to have to push the car up. Uh, um, there's a there's a, a sort of central park in Newcastle that winds up a, a road and it goes for about three kilometres and. Uh, occasionally, if we hadn't trained well enough, my brothers and sisters and and uh, we used to have to push the car up this uh, three kilometre track. And um, it sometimes he used to tell us the car was broken down and uh, by the time we got to the top, you know, you, I mean, lactate was running out your ears and, you know, you couldn't talk. But, uh, and then he jumped in and started up and drive us home. So, uh, you know, it was that sort of thing. Uh, I, I've, I've remembered, you know, getting beaten meets and, 
Uh, I'd win six gold medals and one silver medal, and I'd have to run home. Run home from Maitland's Newcastle, which was about 23 k's, and I was about 11 or 12. Oh, wow. So, uh, oh. with that, he was pretty tough, and um, he had a weird way of telling you that you could do anything you set out to do if you were, you know, you know, as time's gone on, as much as a, um, a nutcase he was, in a sense, he, he, he's pretty right. Yeah. You think that's what he was trying to do? You think he was trying to prove to you as, as kids, like, look, he, anything's possible? Or was he, was, it, was he trying to build physical toughness, mental toughness, or combination? Or was he just trying to build character? What do you think it was? Um, basically, I think he was a psychopath. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he, he probably was trying in his own way to build that sort of stuff. Yeah. He didn't have the easiest of upbringings, I suppose, himself. But, um, mm. I mean, we learned pretty early on. You only get into the sport what you uh, sort of get out of it, what you put in. So yeah. um, he he was a great believer in uh, your Percy Cerati, who was a, a famous uh, Ron, uh, not Ron Clark, uh, Elliot's oh, coach, yeah. the 1,500-metre runner. And, yeah. Um, so we used to do the sand hills, uh, we used to do mega runs, we used to do all sorts of stuff and uh, you know later on when uh, I was, it was funny, remember that uh, fox run or whatever it was called and they used to do some supersets and things of that nature like I remember getting in the pool at five o'clock in the morning and, and getting out at one o'clock in the afternoon to go to school mm. uh, and basically only got out because he was hungry. <laughs> so, you know, we did some uh, some sets and, and from some swimming sessions that went for five, six hours sometimes. So, mm. um, let me say, it did mould me as a coach a little bit because it uh, uh, I learned a lot of uh, a lot from the mistakes that he made and a few of the other coaches that I did have uh, uh, when it came to I was a hundred metre swimmer, but also uh, won a four hundred IM at the Nationals at the same meet, 103 and 400 IM. So as you can see, we were sort of trained at both ends of the spectrum. And um, at the end of the day, I think it stood us in good stead, more so for life itself rather than the actual the actual swimming. And, uh, you know, so I, you know, I, I do owe him a lot when it comes to that. He was a very, very gifted teacher though. He could get across to young kids. Mm. Uh, he could get his message across mm. and, uh, he could motivate like no one else. Mm. Um, and I'd like to think I picked up some of those better traits and and uh, didn't sort of pos uh, possess some of the other sadistic traits that he did have. So um, I suppose it was a weird combination, but at the end of the day, it's sort of, uh, you know, like most things, mate, you can make it, let it affect you or you can use it to your own advantage in whatever you do. So that's what I decided to do at a very, very early age, which is, is why I probably got uh, to the US. Yeah. Well, mate, uh, you came into my life around, I think, about the age of uh, 16 or 17. I was being coached by Terry Buck at Maroubra, and you you were, yeah. uh, you were you came over from a rival club and um, had an immediate impact. I was a, I was a 200 backstroker at the time. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I suffered from asthma as a kid and didn't love putting my face in the water, so backstroke was my, my thing at the time. And I was swimming the 200 backstroke pretty unsuccessfully. wasn't wasn't real good at it. But um, when you came in, you flipped me over to my front and and started getting me to do freestyle, and 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 that kind of was the genesis of me becoming a sprint freestyler. So was there something that you saw in me at that age that you felt like you know I could have success there? Yeah. Um, basically, and we we haven't sort of spoken about this. Um, to this extent, because, uh, you know, obviously you don't sort of fill in exactly what all your thoughts are when at, at that sort of age, yeah. uh, to the athlete, but um, mm -hmm. there wasn't a 50 backstroke at the time. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I've, I'm sure you'll remember the first day I arrived um, because Terry uh, said to me, he says, well, they're all yours, Sato. He said, do what you like. And um, as you know, I came with a reputation of being a bit, a bit uh, scientific and my squads didn't do the mileage and stuff that a lot of people were doing. And uh, I said, okay, first set. And I wrote up on the board and there was about 30 or 40 of you. And I wrote up eight 400s and I put them on the 
after five minutes, <laughs> and I, I left one lane empty on the on the left uh, the right hand side of the pool, and as away they went, and you were the first one to stop. <laughs> so <laughs> I sent you straight to that lane, and that's how I picked the sprinters. I you know the ones that had the faulty goggles and the uh, you know, had uh, missed a turn and stood up and adjusted everything and stuff. That was a pretty barbaric way, but I, we were halfway through a program, a season, and I had to identify who was doing what events. And mm. so uh, actually, that lane that we set up, there was quite a few good sprinters coming out of it, <laughs> and they weren't sprinting at the time. So uh, yeah. they, maybe that's something we should be doing when it comes to identifying the sprinters. It's, it's not a bad way to do it. Goals. I like that. I like that a lot. It's a good theory. I didn't know I ended up there that quickly, but uh, I couldn't imagine. Oh, you were the first. Dan Angelo Basala was very close behind. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you, um, uh, you also had the 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 uh, seriously. You, you did have a problem with your asthma, and and it affected you once you went further than a certain distance. So. Yeah. Um, and I was a firm believer. Like you have to, if you want to be a sprinter, you've got to focus on being a sprinter from as early as you can because mm. you're trying to build certain physio physiological assets, assets yeah. um, to be able to go quick. So the longer you've got to do that because you're, you're dealing more with neuromuscular systems as well as uh, nerves and things of that, they take a lot longer than muscles, so to speak, to mm. condition and, and um, get them to the, what your, you know, what your events, uh, yeah. the stresses that you're going to incur in those sprint events. So um, at that stage, you were still uh, regularly sitting on a nebulizer on the side of the pool. So um, mm. I said to Terry, I remember discussing it with Terry and said, mate, but we've got to make this bloke a sprinter. And I think he's naturally that way inclined anyway. And um, just let's focus on the 53. And then as time goes on, we might be able to get him out to 100. But um, at the end of the day, the medals were the same colour in the 50 as they were in the, every other event. So um, yeah. that's why we yeah. rolled, rolled you over and started to concentrate on the 53. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're right. And you were, the, you were the, one of the very few coaches, I can't remember many, who uh, valued the sprinting and valued the 50 as an event. And, and back in those days, but, you know, we're talking 90, 94, 95, 96 era kind of thing. It's... <laughs> You know, the 50 had only just come into the Olympics just recently in 88. So it still wasn't yep. uh, valued as an event in Australia. We had Kieran Perkins and a bunch of other, you know, well-known Glenn Hausman, 1,500 guys. We were, we were kind yep. of the distance country. And, and you were like, hang on, we've got to value this event and these, these guys. And, you know, these guys need to train specifically. So you brought in real specific specificity to, to sprint training way beyond way way quicker than most coaches did and so um how did you develop your, your theories on that because you were the first coach that i ever knew talk about you know um top end speed and front end speed and back end speed and really breaking the speeds down into um you know different categories and understanding what mm -hmm. those categories were and training those specific zones i mean this just yeah. wasn't happening at the time you were a pioneer in that re regard so how did you develop that uh, well, when I first come back from university, I had a very really, uh, bad leg injury from, uh, uh, you know, from my time at Hawaii, and I, um, I was training greyhounds. My family had one or two dogs, you know, mm. greyhound racing dogs. Yeah. And, uh, anyway, so like, I did a big study on those. Did some muscle biopsies. Um, you know, Dr. Jan was uh, in Hawaii. He was he was one of the first uh, with Doc to be doing uh, muscle biopsies and and identifying you know, what uh, the natural makeup of people were when it comes to the physiology, mm. um, uh, when it comes down to fast twitch, slow twitch, et cetera, et cetera. And um, as it turned out, the, the dogs were nine, above 90% fast twitch fibers and used to really <laughs> die in the backside quickly <laughs> once they got past about the 17 second mark. And, um, and even, you know, just with your general studies, I mean, the body is not capable of going flat out for more than five or six seconds. Um, and uh, there was a bunch of combinations. I also loved listening to some of the top sprinters at the time and interviews. And I'll never forget one an interview that had a very big influence on me was uh, uh, Jim Montgomery, mm. uh, who uh, 
uh, was the first guy to officially, like in the Olympics, break the 50 seconds. Mm. And I remember the guy interviewing him said, oh, wow, what's it like to be the fastest man on earth? And he said, I don't know. He said, my hundred's not a sprint. You know, uh, he said, uh, there's a ton of guys that can beat me over the 50 yards in the university system, you know. Mm. Um, so he said, I'm nowhere near the fastest man in the world. And that sort of stuck in the back of my head for a long time. And as, you know, as I swam myself and things uh, around that time, I, I, it was 110% right, you know, like the 50 and the 100 are two different sports. And it's very, very hard to get them both right at the same time. And I think I adopted what I did with the coaching philosophy because uh, um, people don't realise the 50 is one of the hardest events to get right on a consistent basis mm. because... Uh, there's a very fine line when it comes to power output versus efficiency as far as feeling the water and, uh, and that nature. And, uh, mm. and I still to this day believe that the 50 uh, is, is, a, uh, is not a true, true sprint. It's a, uh, you build a 50 in a mm. sense. You know, yeah. you know, you're, yeah. you're, you're getting hold of the water before you can do something with it. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, it's, uh, and that's something you've got to train because as, as a, also as a uh, athlete tapers and especially athletes that were very muscular and stuff like yourself, um, you had to groove the stroke to um, cater for that extra power output. And if you didn't groove the stroke during those last few weeks of the, of the preparation, I mean, I've seen plenty of guys spin their wheels and, um, you know, with history, I've seen plenty of guys do the, the same thing. And, uh, even when I was swimming myself, I saw uh, there was a couple of European butterflies that were just unbeatable. And then as soon as they started lifting more weights and got bigger and bigger and bigger, I mean, they couldn't apply that into the water. Mm. And, I, and I had the, I had the um, unique experience of watching an American guy, which probably no, not too many people know, Gary Schatz. Um, at the, and I think I mentioned him to you when you were a young bloke because he was about five foot seven. Mm. And he went, uh, he went, you know, twenty-two zero or whatever it was. It was a world record at the time, and yet he was racing your Montgomerys and blokes of that nature that was six point six two. That's what really sort of put me into examining what's the difference between that uh, that the big athlete compared to the smaller athlete, and what changes, as subtle as they were, that needed to be changed for the, him to be able to create the same velocity. Yeah. And yeah. that's where your stroke, on, oh, you know, I'm sure you'll remember, oh, I got you a lot deeper with your, with your stroke and, um, and actually was shortening it up front a little bit because, you know, you, didn't have, you couldn't, you know, hyperextend and be able to apply as much power yeah. uh, compared to, say, um, like a Magnuson or someone like that who yeah. uh, was a totally different kettle of fish. Yeah. You know? yeah. But, um, uh, you know, and, I, and, and when it comes to the 50, I, I mean, I was... Australia's always been very slow to adapt to those sort of things. Um, it's the same with the 15 metres underwater and things mm. of that nature. It's, it's, I, don't, I still don't think we're anywhere near where we should be. Yeah. Uh, you know, when the rules change, that you know, they say, oh, we'll be right sort of thing and, and continue doing the, the five metres underwater and, mm. and not really working on that, uh, you know, that fifth, go on the full 15 metres and, and uh, you know, so it was a whole bunch of things that sort of got me into that. And uh, even though we had a lot of success at that, I, I'd like to think I wasn't a, just just a sprinting, yeah. uh, sprinting coach. And mm. uh, it's like anything else. It's basically came down to, you know, preparing the athletes for the stresses they're going to incur in a race and also trying to teach them how to do that um, whilst under extreme pressure. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's really what it comes down to. I mean, the the theory of sprint is just uh, being able to control your technique under pressure and and maintain it. So, well, like um, you said early on, people were were not ha were sort of looked down upon mm. as being sprinters, you know, because yeah. oh, those blokes don't know don't know what it's like to work. And, and you think, oh, hang on a second, we're just working in different energy systems. And mm. and as some people found when they came to our squad, they look at the sheet and say, well, that's not very hard. But if you did it right. I'd mm. think, holy moly, like Christ, you know, that was, yeah. you know, we used to do more, more work than anyone in the, in the uh, race specific speed. So it's, yeah, um, that you had to be in a state of readiness to be able to do it. And uh, it was bloody hard yakka. 
Yeah. Mate, a couple of other areas that you were, um, you know, put a lot of time and energy in pioneering. It was, it was in the, the blood lactate, you know, area, and then also the altitude, you know, um, training. So talk to us about those two things. Talk to us about, you know, um, blood lactate, first of all, like what, what did you learn from your time studying, you know, that, th that, that, uh, process? Um, well, that, that was an interesting situation because I, I, yes, I did do probably more research than anyone else when it came to that side of things. And, and what I found is, um, you know, being able to do that, which we did to a, a, a great extent, but when it came to teaching other coaches, which I did a lot of, mm. um, you know, we had to come up with a way to uh, give them some tools that they could use on a practical basis, you know, every day. Uh, to monitor how someone was going, whether they were tired and all that sort of stuff. And mm. doing the lactate side of things wasn't that accurate as far as I was concerned because, you know, as you know, you, you, could, you could pull a 17 lactate or whatever, but you, the lactate within your muscles themselves would be up around the 30, mm. 30 or 40, you know. Like, and I mean, we never looked into those sort of things. So I used lactate a little bit differently and boy, I had some ding dong arguments with Donny Talbot and stuff. So, um, about it, because that was what I was trying to, to achieve. I mean, some of my sprinters didn't have massive, um, lactate readings directly after they finished a race, uh, nine minutes later, they could have very high things, but their body, I was teach, trying to teach the body to deal with high levels of lactate and still go quick. So, um, altitude was great for that. It is because it, um, you know, did all the usual things with the extra red blood cells and all that sort of stuff. But, um, what it did do was, um, the body would deal with a lot of the lactate internally before we'd actually take the, the, uh, reading in here. So mm -hmm. it was more we'd take three. If you remember, we used to take one straight after, but then we'd do one at three, six and nine minutes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when we were in a state, um, where we just come off altitude and things like that. Obviously, it wouldn't be that high afterwards, but it'd take a good eight to nine minutes before it'd shoot up through the roof. And to me, as you know, you've got your brain, your liver, and all these other parts of your body that actually use lactate as a fuel. So um, it was basically getting the body more and more efficient. But then as we got closer to the events, I remember we swam off altitude at uh, US Open one year. Mm. Uh, that was a funny story, but um, everyone was dra really dragging their backside. And, um, uh, but they had low lactates when we first got out. And, um, you know, there was a couple of others there that were uh, from other groups uh, that were getting super high lactates. But, um, you know, and I couldn't even begin to explain what we were doing, in a sense, to uh, some of the people that were uh, were uh, jumping on top of this, but um, as it turned out, um, we got through the meet okay, and we, we concentrated more on the 200s and things of that nature, and then when we went back, you actually want to be a little bit less efficient to get the best out of yourself for the 50. So that's why I didn't have to do a lot of that aerobic uh, conditioning and stuff of that nature when we got back and we went into an Olympic trials or or whatever it may be we were setting for. Um, I actually used to uh, detrain yourself and anyone else that was doing the 50 um, away from that system. But it, what it did do is it did allow your body to hang in there better when you got to those really high levels of lactate. And, um, and that's where you know, that last 15 meters came in um, that most people didn't, um, you know, they were decelerating where we were maintaining our our velocity. How do you think coaches can best utilize lactate training? Like, do you, do you think lactate training is, is best uh, served like on a Saturday morning? This is how most coaches use it. A Saturday morning, we're going to do, you know, uh, six 100s on 10 minutes, you know, all out. Is, is that the best way to utilize lactate training or is there a better way to do it? Um, I feel it depends on the athlete, but um, if we're looking at say the 50, 100, Mm -hmm. um, and, and you and Chris were a pretty good, uh, Chris Fider were a good uh, example of it. You, you guys came off totally different programs mm -hmm. and there was only an inch or two between you at the end of the 50, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, you yeah. both hit PBs and things like that, but 
um, Chris had a massive aerobic system compared to yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I said, that's because of your history with the, with the other, we didn't do as much background and, and mega miles with you, um, mm-hmm. as, as we did with others at earlier speed, mm-hmm. uh, earlier times. But, um, um, the six, 100 situation, like that's more for a 200 meter person. I feel, yeah. uh, the physiological breakdowns and that, that are going on in that type of set. Um, are geared more towards the 200. Mm-hmm. What, what I did introduce, and it was because of yourself, and it was uh, another person that I did it with was, uh, well, in the end I was doing it with most, was called set splitting, mm-hmm. where uh, if, if we were, say, trying to get six 100s out, I might take two days to do it, you know, but do two, and, two there, two mm-hmm. here, and two there. And then give you the opportunity. Um, if you look at a person that does that at six one hundreds, um, even on long rests, I mean, we used to do you know, them on uh, ten minutes or twelve minutes or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, they're still not getting close enough, I feel, to their race speed. You know, yeah. uh, whether yeah. it be yeah. their front end speed or their back end or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're getting closer to your back end speed, but you're not in a state of fatigue when you're doing it. So for me, it wasn't specific enough. So mm. um, when it come to your 50 stuff, sometimes we'd only go 30 meters because once you got to the 30 meters and when you're doing it multiple amounts of times, that's when we used to, um, uh, you know, cut down on the reps as well as cut down on the, on the distance itself. So you could hit your stroke rates that you would hit in your, your, um, your race and uh, and get multiple amounts of them out. But instead of doing it all in one hit, um, I'm a great believer that if we could get six of them in the space of 48 hours, mm. we would get the same benefit as doing that. And once you looked over a three to six month period, uh, you would be doing a lot more at that specific speed uh, than anyone else was. Mm. And uh, I'd like to think that was a, a pretty good reason why you were consistently quick um, in your main event because we were specifically prepared for it for sure yeah another thing that you did that i remember and that i that i use in my training when i when i coach caesar cielo or some some of my other top sprinters you know we did a set where it was a, a 25 front end from the block 125 aerobic and then a 50 back end you know this this yeah. was a set that you would give me repeatedly and i used it throughout my coaching because it was so so damn good and effective um, you know, how, why did you come up with kind of splitting it up that way? And why did you think that was effective for us? Well, um, it was effective in the sense that it, it actually portrayed a lot of the, uh, you know, it was mimicking the situation of a race Yeah, and, and they were long rest type situations in some time. Sometimes we do multiple amounts from back to back. back. Multiple, yeah. But, yeah. Um, you know, you, you're in a state of readiness usually as you walk off the street to do at least the 25 at race speed. Yeah. Hopefully. If you haven't been out on a drink or, you know, if, if you've done the right thing with yourself in between sessions, which is another subject. But, yeah. um, you know, so we'd get up and, and hit that sort of pace, uh, hit the stroke rates. Um, and then instead of sitting on the wall and having a rest, uh, I like to... Uh, do act. It wasn't even active rest. It was, uh, as you remember, we once we got in good shape, we let go for a threshold or threshold plus, which is um, I think they call it an aerobic threshold or whatever yeah. these days. But um, uh, I remember doing the same for the hundred meter people. We're doing a fifty, then a two hundred, and then a fifty. And and what it was doing is like you'd have to hit on your feet at the uh, within a couple of tenths of your your, your front end mm-hmm. of your race. Um, and then instead of um, resting on the wall, you would be keeping going at a certain rate. So the oxygen was still being supplied, mm. you know, and to me that taught, it was asking your body questions as far as, well, okay, if you're trying to get rid of some lactate and things of that nature, your body's got to um, recruit more MCT4s and things of that nature, which actually carry the lactate in and out, the MCT1s and MCT4. Um, and what that did, uh, it made you, it really was really good for your aerobic system too. It was very, very specific. And it's a, it was more or less an advanced form of fart, fart leg training. But 
when you got to the end of that 200 or the 125, like you're talking about, you'd get only five to 10 seconds rest and turn around and your chest would still be beating and you know, you'd be still in a, a reasonable state of stress. And then you had to give a 25 or a 50 meter at that back end speed with good technique. Now, doing it when you're fresh, you can do it with your hands tied behind your back. But mm. after you've already done a sprint and then a threshold type 125 or a 200, mm. um, five to 10 seconds rest, you're still puffing and, and your body's still screaming for oxygen. Mm. And then you're asking yourself to be controlled, good technique, and, um, and, and, and really maintain your velocity into the wall. So you're not decelerating, you're actually still maintaining your velocity for that last part and what i did find and it's the same with yourself mate you know you end up going 49 lows and 48 highs in relays um and broke 50 in the individual 100 and stuff like that and that really was because once you got to what i felt was as fast as we could get um we were able to put some of that speed endurance into you um to get you up to 100 and then once we got closer to uh, our main events we forgot about the 100 and came back down to our 50 but it was always good to overtrain in a sense in some of those uh, energy systems and then then get very specific in that last preparation yeah well mate uh, one of my one of my uh, best memories is the the olympic trials in sydney when i qualified for my first olympic team you were my coach and it was a it was an incredible moment for us um as a team and um i just felt very well prepared like i felt like um i understood sprinting i understood the 50 i was very prepared for the 50 i was very confident going in one of the things you would always tell me is you know don't rip and tear don't rip and tear so it wasn't about bashing that shit out of the water it wasn't about ripping the water it was about holding water and holding holding length and maintaining length and that was one of the yep. things you always drilled into me so yep. how, how did you come to the understanding that sprinting wasn't about ripping but it was about feeling and maintaining um i, I had a i had a habit which i don't think was a bad habit i used to look at other sports and i used to look at mm. rowing and things of that nature to see uh you know how they were getting the maximum of efficiency to get through liquid because um you know as far as running's concerned they could transfer a lot of their speed and power into the ground because they had spikes on mm. you know you don't have spikes or you weren't allowed to wear paddles when it came to the, the swimming so um and and that was where the background come in when it came back all the way back back to dr jan and and to even doc councilman why why was mark spitz better than everyone else at the time and yet he wasn't the would you say the most perfect specimen as far as an athlete's concerned? I mean, sure, he was big and tall and all the rest of it, but he didn't have muscles hanging off the top of muscles. Yeah. Um, and when water, he was very efficient and it was not creating a lot of bubbles and stuff like that. And, uh, and that was why whatever power he was putting in, he was getting some resultant force from it. And, um, you know, it's, it, uh, and I felt I saw a lot of big guys that, you know, guys that were much bigger than you that couldn't live with you as far as the 50 was concerned. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was basically because you were getting hold of the water and getting a great deal of lift and, uh, and power out of it. And I also, at that time, there was a, a very big belief that the back part of the stroke was the, um, the be all and end all. And, and I, you know, I, from, studying and stuff and talking with Dr. Jen over the years, realized that it was, it was that middle section of the stroke was where you created the most forward propulsion. Mm -hmm. And so um, in your case, we had to be changing direction with your hands to grab stagnant water. And, and, and people don't realize, I mean, as soon as you, you know, pull your hand in the same direction for more than two or three inches, you're starting to slip. Mm -hmm. So you had to be searching for stagnant water. And, and in your case, I, I, you know, I remember saying, well, actually, there's three different ways you can grab the water, not two. Normally, it was your direction and, um, you know, the left, right, and certain pitches with your hands of, and things of that nature. But I also felt that it was a, another way to grab more water. As you change depth, you also were grabbing stagnant water. And in your case, you got down much deeper than most mm -hmm. uh, and then changed direction. And that was happening around that middle 
middle section of your sculling action under the water. And uh, the resultant force you were getting off that was, and, um, and that was through practice. You know, basically, uh, I'm sure you remember running along the pool and then diving in, mm. doing all those sort of things where we were trying to get up to that sort of velocity without any effort, you know. And I, I remember specifically doing a lot of them because we had a few boys in the squad that weren't that well coordinated and used to fall us over tip and <laughs> things of that nature. So uh, <laughs> you could really sort out the ones that weren't going to make it. But they couldn't run along the side of the pool and dive in without hurting themselves. But, mm. um, you know, that was to get up to that sort of velocity because, uh, and we had the towing machine where we, we I used to get you up. I you remember we used to get up to world record speeds and a little bit above uh, to uh, hone our skills as well as our neuromuscular system which is the messages from the brain to the muscle and and to me that was probably one of our biggest advantages you know that not many people were thinking about the neuromuscular system at that time and from swimming myself and uh, boxing and things that I'd done in the past that's pretty much the first system that goes mm. it's less of mm. it's, it's more nervous system uh, energy rather than uh, aerobic or anaerobic and all the rest of it. So um, that's why we did a lot of those, you know, 15 metre sprints um, at turnover of what we need. You know, teaching them to feel the water is, is easy, but teaching them to feel uh, to um, feel it when you're going more than two metres per second is a whole other sport. Yeah. So yeah. that's the way I used to look at it. And, um, and you know, I, I think we were quite successful in it. Mm. Yeah, mate, listen, one of the other things I learned from you and that, that I took into my coaching uh, and I tried to do, you know, the way you did it is you coached each athlete as, as an individual athlete. So you may, have had, you may have had a sprint set, but there may have been four different ways to do it. You know, like I may have been doing it one way and, um, you know, Tim, Tim LaForest may have been doing it another way and, really? um, you know, and then Chris Feidler was doing it another way. So... And then you had your middle distance set and then you had your backstrokers and your butterfly, whatever they were doing, you know, your, your 200 yeah. guys, your 400 guys. So everybody in your squad had an individual kind of mindset, not mindset, but workout in terms of like, this is specifically for you. This is going to get you fast. Yep. And that's something that I yep. tried to incorporate into my training and, and it helped a lot. So, um, you know, there were a lot of people that would just shove you in a group. Why, why did you feel like you, you needed to individualize things? Well, um, I still think we've got that problem now <laughs> yeah. um, in, a lot of in a lot of places. And I'm oh, sure yeah. it's the same through the U.S. But sure. um, you can still have a big group and, and be individual with each athlete. Um, obviously, you're uh, being just even your height um, uh, compared to, say, a Chris or a Dave Carter or, a, mm. you know, those guys. Are, you know, that's, so you can't do the same stroke as them as well as your physiological makeup and that was the first thing I used to try and learn it's like what you know how much of an aerobic system you had and all that sort of stuff and, and could we capitalize on that because really the better base we could get aerobically and this is where sprinters didn't like doing it but um, I'm sure you remember some of our 3k time trials at six and a half thousand feet and uh, trying to sleep in that day yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that was the following day after. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and um, I remember John D. Skinner running over to me at the Olympic Training Center when Chris went a okay on trial and it was went about fifty-five or fifty-six minutes for it, holding the sub one tens the whole way. And he says, "Isn't he going a hundred meters?" Because they had a bet going if he could break Johnny's record of forty-nine four, you know. Oh, right. and um, he couldn't believe it and, and, and then he went like 203 or something the last 200 metres but mm. um, as I said I, the, the better, the more aerobic uh, the stronger your aerobic system and your, and your anaerobic system it allowed us to do more of that sort of work and recover from it quicker and, um, and you hit the head on, you hit the nail on the head a little bit before when you said I got on, I, I, got, I felt like I was better prepared you know, one I used to love, and I'm sure you were the same, was is teaching your athlete what they're doing and why they're doing it and how it's going to benefit from it. 
Yeah. And, and you'll find you'll get a better job out of your athlete if they, they know what part of their race it's going to help mm. um, and how they, you know, because I, I know I used to drive a lot of you guys nuts um, with the one to 10. I'd say how much has gone out of the tank, you know, one to 10, one to 10, because the older athlete, you know, you can't empty their tank as much as when they're 17, 18, 19 year old. So mm. the amount yeah. of dosage in those sets had to change as you got older. And um, you, you had someone like yourself and Chris and uh, Phil Rogers broke the Australian record at the age of 31 in the 100 breaststroke, you know. Um, and it was because we were doing as much work as our body could do before it would start to lose technique. Mm -hmm. And even in those 3K time trials or whatever set we were doing, uh, the greatest sort of measure of how much you could do was when your technique started to break down. Mm. and um, I remember with you there was a set of 25s long rest 25s that we do and as soon as you got to five or six you could still maintain the same velocity and the time but you started to look you know, as I used to say to you it looked like a packet of poo tickets and you gotta you know you gotta we're gonna put the fins on and do the next three with the fins on or something like that yeah, until yeah. you know to finish it off with the rest of the group but you wouldn't be doing it because you would be practicing bad technique so um, uh, same with the 50, 100 boys, you know, as soon as they could do phys physically, they could do eight. But as soon as we went past five, uh, their technique would start to uh, suffer. And as you said, they'd start to rip and tear to maintain that velocity. And um, so we'd cut the set, uh, so to speak. And um, it was a, the other thing that happened with that is that it would take an extra three or four days to recover from that sort of work if you uh, took too much out of the tank because you weren't dealing with muscular, just your muscular system, you're dealing with your nervous system and your uh, neuro, neuromuscular system, which used to tear down and take a lot more time to recover. Well, it's funny. This is the reason why I wanted you on because, um, you know, I give David Marsh a lot of credit and, and I've, I've talked about him a lot and, I've, and, and, and everybody knows the influence he had on me. He's but a great coach. Yeah. He's, a, he's a great coach, but I think you've had more influence on me than any coach because I think I coach more like you than anybody because uh, you yeah. believed, you, yeah, I mean, you believed in when, when, when you were done, you were done or when it was time to switch a set, it was time to, you know, add some, add some fins or let's adjust so that the technique stays the same. And then when it was time to recover, you believed in recovery, you know, like you yeah. gave us recovery so that we could come back 24, 48 hours later and, and, and go again, you know? So yeah, quick. Yeah. yes, the philosophies that I, you know, have, have developed, uh, adopted, let's say, are your philosophies, you know? So you, you've had a, a, a bigger influence on me than anybody. And I just wanted to give you credit for that because, um, we did some amazing work and I really believe in, in a lot of Thanks, things. Mate. But I've got, I've got to say that you know, having, having the philosophy is one thing, but applying it to each and every athlete is mm. uh, not everyone can do. And that's why I was so proud of the way you handle those senior boys when it comes to the fifties, especially and, and even the hundreds that yeah. um, without knowing exactly what they were doing, I had a fair idea, but just by watching them compete that they were doing the right type of stuff. So, you know, having the knowledge is one thing, which is I, I always say, but being able to apply it is a whole nother ball game. So, uh, you know. Well, it's nice. I had, you know, I try and give credit to all, all the coaches that have influenced me because they've all, I've been lucky. I've had great coaching influences, mm -hmm. you know, yourself yep. and Terry Buck and then, um, Ian Pope and, and okay. David Marsh yeah. and, and then um, and then Richard Quick came in as a, as a coach in his final years and I got to watch him coach which was amazing too so you all had um, mm. your own individual styles but I think uh, like I said I've applied more of or more of the stuff that I did with you I apply to my own training and, and the way that I've coached these guys because uh, ultimately, I think I, I believe in specificity. I believe in specific training. You know, in order to go yeah. fast, you have to train fast, um, yeah. and you have to be ready to swim fast. So that, that's yeah. where recovery comes into it too. So, um, well, we used uh, to say. You remember, we used to, I used to say to you guys that Tuesday and Thursday afternoon were your main sets. That was your main, most important days. And you'd go, well, hang on, we don't even train those days. Mm. And I was exactly right. You know, mm -hmm. what you do outside. I'm giving you that to rest, not to go and play. And, yeah, um, yeah. you know, to get yourself, A, fully recovered from what you've done 
and B, being fully fueled up, ready to go for whatever the next task was, uh, was your responsibility. And, um, and, and that determined what's, how good a job you did on those rest periods uh, would determine how, what you got out of the last set and what you're going to get out of the next set. Yeah. Um, mate, uh, you've had so many Olympians and you've coached so many uh, great athletes. And, and I was lucky to be around a lot of great athletes too. It wasn't just great coaches that I was around. You know, we, I was around incredible athletes. And I think my my earliest influences as an Olympian or Olympians was kind of Lee Habler and, and Malcolm Allen. You know, these, these guys really... Um, gave me hope because they were in my training group you know they were my friends these were these were people yeah. that i saw make the olympic team and yeah. um and they gave me the inspiration to kind of kick on and try and do it years later but um how how why did you want to go into that realm, like elite training elite coaching and 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 why do you think you had success in that area uh, well, as I said, I, I sort of, I think when I went to America, I probably learned more in the first six months uh, about training than I had in 13 years here. Uh, from A, having my dad as a coach, and then I had a couple of other coaches. And, um, and I've always felt naturally I was more towards a 100-meter freestyler. Uh, and, but when you go on 10K a session, 10 sessions a week, as well as running three times a week and lifting weights and stuff, very hard to be quick mm. and um, so that's where I said I learned a lot from some of the things that I was put through and uh, when I went over to America I'll never forget because uh, Dr. Jan had a camera running along the bottom watching you swim mm. and your technique and he was sometimes down underneath the window and all this sort of stuff and my first season um, I was doing I worked it out I was doing probably oh, I think it was somewhere between 35 and 40 percent mileage of what I was used to doing and I used to say to him, Coach, you know, I've got to do some work, you know. Uh, he said, you're not going to do anything until you learn how to swim properly. You know, so he ingrained that into me real early because I got to meets and, you know, I'd be behind the block wanting to rip someone's head off and he'd come over and say, if you don't sit down in the chair and relax, I'm going to pull you out, <laughs> things like that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we didn't know that we had to hit and arousal levels to get the best out of ourselves and all that sort of stuff. It was all being aggressive and, and you were very similar to that. That's why we had to sort of learn uh, how to control yourself and how to self-manage. Mm. Um, uh, Lee was a great example of that. Like she was a 15-year-old girl when she made the Olympics and yet she swum, and you'll appreciate this, she swum her event 200 back on the last day of the Olympics mm. uh, for the swimming. And if you haven't got a great amount of self-management skills with when there's uh, free entertainment, there's free McDonald's, there's mm. free this and free that in Olympic Village. Mm. If you haven't got those self-management skills, you're going to fall between the cracks and a lot do and a lot did. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when you look at uh, what you said before, I've always believed that an educated athlete is a, is a dangerous one, you know, and, and this is why um, yourself and, and uh, blokes like Chris and stuff went, you know, three or four years in a row, just continually hitting PBs when you had to and were able to step up at the right time and go bang um, because you knew what you were doing and you knew if you were getting a bit uptight or whatever it was, you, you, you'd, you'd adjust. So you got on the block in, a, in a, a confident manner, but you also were in a state of readiness to go, to go with controlled aggression, you know, not ripping and tearing, as you've said before. Um, was just controlled aggression and you had to get hold of the water before you done something with it you know mm. and that basically uh that i think sort of put you guys a little bit uh above everyone else and i remember you remember we went to tasmania and we went first second third and fourth uh sixth and seventh in the uh in the men's 50 freestyle yeah um, and they and everyone hit pbs and, mm. and and that was no fluke and it's not because of me that was because I can only get an athlete to a certain, this is all coaches can get them to a certain place mm. when it comes to the preparation. But as you know, and as a lot of athletes will attend, uh, uh, admit, like when that whistle blows, you know, and you get on the block, that's the loneliest place in the world, mm. you know, and there's nothing I can do for you or your mother or anyone else. And if you're not prepared, mm -hmm. A, physically, and B, know how to mentally get the best out of yourself you're going to struggle right yeah. but 
uh, I think that was one of the biggest things with yourself over time is that you knew you were going to swim fast. It was a matter of how much faster am I going to go? I can't wait to get up and do it because it's not that I'm going to swim slow or what it, whether I'm going to swim well or not. It's how much better am I going to swim? Uh, mm -hmm. Because you had that mm -hmm. feeling, and that was my goal. That was my sole goal as a coach was to put an athlete on there to be able to look to the left, look to the right, and say, "No bastard up on this block is as better prepared than I am mm -hmm. in the right area." Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And you had the, you know, you were one of the lucky ones that had that feeling, mm -hmm. you know, and was able to capitalise on it. And, um, and and that's where I think we've still got to go there with a lot of our sprinter or Australian uh, sprinters. We've, yeah, we've got the young bloke and stuff, but we've still got people swimming 22 plus, you know, in, in mm. 50 metres. And mm. the amount of people that went as fast as you, you can count on one hand. Yeah. Uh, still, and we're talking about what, 25 years later, you know what I mean? So, or well, 20 years later. Yeah. Know, and uh, yeah. to me, that's, that's not progression, that's regression. Mm. And yeah. uh, it all comes back down to the... Uh, um, the philosophy, I suppose you could say. Well, that comes, that, that brings me to the next topic is like, you know, I, I was a proud New South Wales swimmer and the many, many, you were producing many Olympians to come out of New South Wales. Um, what the, what the hell, what the hell's going on with New South Wales swimming? Um, you know, it's, it just seems to be in a hole. Like what's going on? Um, well, you know, I could talk about that for probably the next four hours, mate. But I'm probably boring the hell out of your poor listeners now, I am. But um, a lot of things. But at the end of the day, mate, I think, um, uh, how can I put this? I think we went, I think we became a victim of our own success um, with the coaching side of it. Um, you remember when I was at Sydney Uni that I used to take the little ones all the way through to the seniors, like and even when we were putting some Olympians and stuff. And and then I was I was threatened by the national body that if I stopped, uh, that I had to stop taking those juniors, you know, and just concentrate on the seniors. Otherwise, you wouldn't get your funding. And um, I sort of argued with that and told them what to do with that. And continue to do what I was doing because, you know, I think our better coaches need to be involved in the junior progress as well. And we handed them over to inexperienced coaches and good job of educating them. You know, um, a lot of coaches felt threatened. Like I, I was lucky in a sense, I, I used to enjoy educating the coach below me mm. um, on everything that I knew, you know, uh, and you knew that through the athletes. I used to try and educate the athletes as yeah. much as I could. Yeah. And, um, you know, and a couple of coaches I've had under me have gone on to train world record holders and stuff like Steve Alderman um, and, uh, you know, people of that, that ilk. So uh, a lot of other coaches looked at their assistants more as threats than as part of their team. Mm. And so we had a group come through that weren't, weren't as well educated as what we were. Like we were lucky in the sense that we were, exposed to some of the senior coaches to speak and uh, and i know when i used to run some of the um what do they call them high performance stroke camps and stuff like that mm. um on the national camps i used to always bring in five or six uh sports scientists because you had your bob trephines uh you had you know your alan davies and, and all different types of uh they were coming from different uh, adam pine from the institute and and I used to, the, I think the most education we got was when we put all them in a room and I'd fire a question at them and watch them argue, you know, about their interpretation of what was, what was going on with the lactates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it give us a, because um, I used to always be pumping into the coaches, you know, like listen to everything and take on board what you think's right, trash the rest. And uh, at some stage you'll come up with a recipe that you can, you know, you can, you can live with as far as, your philosophy is concerned and no one's completely right and no one's completely wrong you know and uh, uh, which uh, that was an era that we went through but that that next level of coach uh, didn't come up now a lot of them are head coaches in programs and they're struggling um, the other thing is that the education the education's just not there I mean you your uh, national conference uh, sure they, they they put on a good spread and all the rest of it but it's the same old subjects and 
um, you know, the same people in a sense. So they invite some people now and then to do things. But, um, you know, a lot of your coaches are out on the golf course and things like that, you know, at yeah. the conferences rather than being in, in front of the things. I, I'll never forget a one lecture I did up there and Forbes Carlisle, God love him, God rest his soul, I think he was 93 sitting in the front row mm. and he didn't stop taking notes from the time I opened my mouth mm. till the time I finished. And, yeah. and as I said to the crowd, you know, because they actually asked me the same question you just asked me. And I said, and there's your answer. I said, he's 93. He doesn't even buy long life milk anymore, you know, <laughs> in case he's not there to have it. But he was taking notes at a hundred miles an hour. And I said, that's the thirst for knowledge that we need to get back into the sport. Mm. And, you know, as you know, I had a, a, a hiatus of about uh, six or six years or eight years before I got back into it again. And, um, and there was no innovation. Yeah. yeah none. You know, they, they were all doing stuff that they were doing 10 years before. Mm. Um, and they were actually doing less, you know, mm. when it comes to the race, you know, your uh, sports science departments used to put out your race analysis. Mm. And, uh, and we used to get, before we left the pool from that session, well, I'll never forget the first time I went back and worked at uh, the New South Wales Institute of Sport. And we, we went to the first meet and I said, where's the, <laughs> where's the data? And they say, oh, you'll get that tonight. You know, I said, what use is it to us tonight when the finals are on? You know, yeah. And, and Talk to my athlete this morning so they can go and relax and have a sleep. Da, 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 da. And, um, you know, things of that nature, I think we've really, we really regressed in, mm. the, in that area. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's a, a heap of other reasons. Um, and, and look, this is across a lot of sports, Brett. You know, look, um, I think the reasons, um, the number one reason on a national level is because we've got CEOs in the position of CEOs. You know, it's, it more becomes the bottom line mm. uh, than it does what really needs to be done um, to uh, get results. I mean, you know, if I got any government money, mate, it went straight to you guys as far as we went to attitude. We, mm -hmm. we, we come up with something different um, and something that was going to benefit. And I used to, what would you say, I'd, I'd sort of commit to whoever's given us the money that you're going to see some bang for your buck. You're going to see we're not going, we're not going to Queensland for a holiday. We're going up there yeah. to a particular thing, or we were going to altitude or, mm. or whatever it may have been. Uh, we were going up there to improve, uh, and we weren't going for a, a, a free holiday where we trained at the same time. It, there was always a specific purpose, but um, unfortunately, a lot of that crept into our sport, uh, especially in New South Wales, and. Um, you know, and then all of a sudden we had a lot of a lot of athletes and it was pretty much, I remember having phone calls the day I went out of it again saying, well, we can't stay here if you're not here, so we're going to Queensland. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so yeah. everyone wants to buy up to Queensland. And it was a shame because it's really hurt us. It's really hurt us. And we got a bunch of coaches. Days. Uh, no, I'm not saying everybody. Uh, we've still got some sensational coaches, but... Um, a lot of them don't want to roll up the sleeves and do eight hours on deck and then eight hours on the computer when they go home. Mm. You know, they don't think like mm. that. And, um, you know, and I think that's hurt us because we, we as a country, I feel, used to have to overachieve to even go anywhere near uh, competing with the U.S. Mm -hmm. simply because of our numbers. Yep. You know, so we had less talent, but we had to do a better job with that le less numbers to, to even compete. You know, and, um, you know, as well as that's pretty much, I think, one of you know, a couple of the big reasons why we're struggling at the moment. And, um, yeah, well, I'm not really keen to get back into the situation because you're talking, to, you're talking, the people making the decisions have got the least amount of knowledge about the sport. Yeah. Well, mate, I've always been one uh, kind of like you. I just, I just enjoy coaching the athlete, you know. So I don't, I don't get too much in the politics and uh, let them, you know. I, I just love coaching the athletes, and that's where you know I, I, I love being, um, being coached by you because that's that was your passion. So, mate, I just want to say thank you and uh, appreciate you doing this. And 
a yeah. uh, lot, lot to learn out of this. So uh, I know, I know a lot of coaches listen to my podcast, so they, they'll uh, listen right. intently on this stuff and uh, appreciate you sharing a lot of your thoughts today. Not a problem, mate. And any time. Yeah. Uh, this any time at all. Yeah. No well, worries, mate. mate. Well, th- uh, good to see you again and uh, stay healthy. And uh, what do you think? You think the Olympics are going to go on next year? What's your personal opinion? Oh, mate, they might get pushed back. Who knows? I mean, uh, depends what happens with the uh, with the virus. I mean, I think it's going to help a lot of athletes, but it's going to make it difficult for a lot of the senior athletes that were sort of hanging around trying to make it to the next Olympics. And then uh, it's been put back 12 months, and it doesn't sound a lot, but uh, 12 months is a long time in swimming. You know? and, uh, uh, look, it'll survive. It'll survive, and when it's whether it be the next year or, or the year after. Um, It'll it'll kick on. I, I'm really excited watching you know some of the newer athletes coming through. Um, you know we've 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 gone through the uh, what's the name era, Phelps, yeah. Phelps and yeah. Phelps and Thorpe era and and things. And now you've got the uh, the young bloke that's shown all the talent in the world and um, Dressel. Yeah. Dressel, I, I, Dressel, yeah. And I hope he gets a hundred right uh, because you know well, I, I thought Magnuson was capable of going forty-seven five. And, Everyone thought I was nuts, but um, you know, if they get that back, back look, he's a good example actually. And that everyone was thinking, oh, he's got a very good back end, but I, I felt that his last 15 meters was still his weakness. Um, and oh, yes. um, yeah, and that was where the next couple of tents were going to come from um, when it came to the hit, trying to break the world record. And you look at this, uh, there's four, sort of four or five athletes out there now, uh, Dressel's one of them, and that, that have got the speed, uh, they've got good endurance and stuff like that. Uh, if they can get the combination right for the 100, I think we could be seeing a, a mid-47, 100 free. And, and um, you know, that's where I think we should be at. It yeah. And hopefully by the Olympics, that's where we will be at. No, mate, and, I'm with you. Uh, I think Chalmers uh, has got the back end right, and, and he's starting to develop a little bit of the front. So if he, yeah. if he can get out on it, uh, he's definitely got a shot too, which will, which should be great, you know, an Aussie and, a, and a, an American going at it. But um, Absolutely. Yeah. And as you know, the key to getting that back, uh, that uh, front end speed is not doing too much of front end speed. A lot of it's to do with back end and yeah. efficiency because uh, yeah. you, know, you don't want to be burning the fuel too quick on the way down, even though, uh, which reminds me of something you did, Rick. Back in Sydney, uh, sorry to, to bring it up, but I remember you telling the guys you were gonna, you'd been looking at what the fastest split was in the world ever, 100 free. And it was, so we were at some meet, it might have even been just a state title or something like that. And, uh, you know, to come the final, you went through in 22 6 or something on, mm. on your feet. Yeah. <laughs> was it 22 6? I was 22 6. Yeah. Like 22, that, six. <laughs> And the whole crowd went quiet. Like everyone's going, what is this bloke's going to go about 46? <laughs> and uh, uh, to say the grand piano hit was an understatement. And I, I, <laughs> I think the last 15 metres you were, you were wishing that the old nebulizer was surgically inserted. <laughs> But it was actually it was in, it was in Yokohama and uh, and I went out and I was telling everyone yeah it was it was, it was 2000, 2001 I think and uh, yeah and, and I remember telling everyone I was going to go out in world record pace which I did twenty two six to my feet but I remember getting out of the pool and they had a they had an incline like this they had an incline <laughs> that went to the warm down pool and I remember having to try to walk up this incline to get to the warm warm down pool it took me about fifteen minutes to walk fifteen yards I couldn't do it. <laughs> it was, well, we were in the stand just giggling because you were doing two two steps forward, one step back, and three sideways. And we said, "Oh, Brett's got the wobbly boot on this time." <laughs> oh, mate, it was awful, oh, horrible experience. But you know, you, you don't know your limits until you push them. That's right, mate. It was good, and it was a bit of fun as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it really did entertain the crowd, anyway. And uh, I don't, I think, Aram, uh, what's his name, Eric the Eel. <laughs> Eric Muslim Barney, I think he had the last 10 metres was faster than you all. <laughs> Mate, I was standing still. I was digging digging trenches the last 10 metres. Oh, sorry to bring that up, mate. It's a very painful memory. Oh, that's a classic. I love it. Thanks, mate. <laughs> uh, listen, I appreciate yeah. this. Uh, good to see yeah. you, buddy. You too, mate. Take care. All right, mate. Take care. Later. Ciao.